a.m. Eastern. University of New Hampshire political science professor Andrew Smith teaches a course on the New Hampshire presidential primary. And in today's class, he focuses on the history of the primary and its significance in the presidential election process. New Hampshire has traditionally held the nation's first presidential primary. This class is about an hour, 15 minutes. All right, welcome. Um, today we're going to talk about the history of the New Hampshire primary. But before we get into the history of the New Hampshire primary specifically, I want to talk for a bit about the history of the nomination process in total. How do we nominate the candidates for president? Um, the things I want to talk about overall are first off, give you a sense of the New Hampshire primary. New Hampshire did not start off with the first presidential primary. Um, I'm going to talk about how it developed in importance over the, la over the, the years we've had the primary, particularly since 1952. Uh, and then the third part I'm going to, to really focus on today are efforts uh, to bump New Hampshire out of its slot as the first primary, how those things happened, uh, and what was uh, done to respond to them, in particular that the Secretary of State uh, is required by law to set the primary date of New Hampshire's primary uh, one week before any similar contest. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, later on this week, uh, Secretary of State Gardner will be coming to class to talk about some of these issues uh, later on. And finally, it's important to note that New Hampshire's primary is first, and at one time we had a saying here that said, always first, always right. Well, it's not always right. The, um, uh, the, the one, the, the candidate who becomes the eventual nominee or the eventual president doesn't always have to win the New Hampshire primary. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well as we go on. So when did primaries start and what happened with that? First off, there's nothing in the Constitution about nominating candidates for president. In fact, the Constitution's pretty quiet completely on how we choose who the nominees are going to be. Um, Article 2, section, uh, Article 2, paragraphs 2 to 5 says that the states will appoint electors in the manner of their choosing to the Electoral College. So the states appoint electors, because remember, this, we have a, a, a two-step process when we elect people for president. Um, the, the, we, we essentially are voting for a, a, a can, a, a representatives to the Electoral College. The people in the Electoral College actually do the election. Um, this was un understood to range from popular election in some states to selection by the legislature. So that's how the original uh, electors were done. And the reasons for this was that the states had a lot of different qualifications for who counted as a voter. Uh, the South, very different from the North, mainly in the Northeastern states, New England and so forth. There was much more of a tendency in the early years to have popular sovereignty where people could actually uh, choose the delegates uh, to the, the conventions. But uh, other states with particular slave populations didn't have that. So the Constitution doesn't say anything about the nomination of candidates for uh, president, largely because when the Constitution was written, we didn't have what we think of now as political parties. In fact, they were generally frowned upon by the framers of the Constitution. They didn't like the idea of political parties. But politics being what it is, very soon after we instituted our Constitution and it was ratified and, and the Constitution of 1787 afterwards, we started to see the formation of factions within the early governments. And by the 18 elect, 1800 election, we saw the, the creation, what we would think of as our first political parties in the United States. You had John Adams representing the Federalist Party and Thomas Jefferson, uh, the representative of the Democratic Republican Party. So by 1800, we already have seen parties. So how did we nominate candidates for president back in these days? Well, we had something that was referred to as King Caucus or the Congressional Caucus System. So by 1800, we had members of Congress. They identified with political parties. They voted as political blocks in Congress often. And what they would do is meet in caucus, so the members uh, of the House and the Senate of these particular party caucuses would meet and they would choose their, they would vote on who they wanted to have as their party's representative or their no, uh, nominee for president. Now, most states uh, still elected electorals to electoral college. Uh, 
uh, by this time, rather than having them appointed by the legislatures. And what we started to see is at, uh, that voting for slates of electors became common. So you wanted to vote for your party's electors when you, uh, when you were voting for who you wanted your electoral college representatives to be. So parties started being more important in the nomination process, but they also became much more important in how campaigns were being run back in the states as well. So uh, King Caucus goes on for a while. It finally falls apart. Uh, it started to come apart really with the demise of the Federalist Party in, in 1816. And there was a period there that we refer to as the era of good feelings, where it was essentially a single party government. But even though the Democratic Republican Party was the major party, you would still see fissures start to develop in, within that party. Uh, you, this inter-party competition really came to a head in the election of 1824. And if you remember in your classes on the American presidency, then in 1824 was a four-way election. And the election went to the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, uh, it was John Quincy Adams was chosen to be president and even though Andrew Jackson got more of the popular vote across the country and he got more of the electoral votes, but he didn't have a majority. So after that happened, there was a real mess. Uh, the parties really started to break up, and that required a kind of a new, uh, a new settlement of parties as well as a new nominating system for the parties. And what we saw is what we call the national nominating conventions. And these started really along the lines about the 1836 election, and they've lasted really to what we have today. We still have national nominating conventions. They're very different now than they were back then, but they still have a function in which the party, and this now in modern days, the Republican and the Democratic Party, will meet in the summer before the election and hold a convention where they officially nominate a candidate to be their party's representative for president. So the, the reasons that we've seen this, first off, we had the breakup of the party. Secondly, we've seen some major technological changes that occurred in the early part of the 1800s. First, we had great improvements in transportation. Roads, um, uh, then we saw the development of roads, early development of railroads. Uh, so it became easier to move people around. Uh, you didn't have to have your congressional delegation stuck down in Washington and not really be able to communicate with people back in their homes. Uh, you also saw improved communications amongst people. So we saw the development first of large-scale newspapers, the penny press mass newspapers, where you could get information about what was going on in Washington to other people around the country. And then later on, you saw the development of telegraph and things like this, where you could actually have faster communications. The post office was much more, became more efficient as roads were being built out and you had railroads. So communications was better. It made it so that uh, having a, a national convention was more feasible. You could do it. In the past, it really wasn't something you could do. Another reason we saw a development of a national uh, c a convention is because the whole nature of politics changed. Uh, the big difference was a huge increase in suffrage, suffrage being, being the ability to vote, the right to vote. Uh, in 1824, only about 400,000 people were eligible to vote. And, and remember, this is white males. Uh, were eligible to vote. By uh, 1840, this had risen up to 2,400,000. 2, so a big boom in the number of people who were eligible to vote, which really meant that the old-fashioned system of having the caucus in Congress choosing who the nominee just didn't seem right. If you had that many people voting, you, uh, people really clamored for a more democratic system of, of, of choosing who the nominees would be. And actually, New Hampshire was at the forefront of that. And uh, Franklin Pierce, who may not have been the best president or is often on the list of some of the worst president from New Hampshire, um, uh, was instrumental in, in, in uh, one of the early representatives for the uh, first national nominating conventions. Um, so what we saw with those nominating conventions, the delegates were chosen by their party leaders at party conventions or state conventions. The formula was set by the uh, party's congressional representation, not on the party's strength within states. Uh, they had actual nominating campaigns for those conventions. And it was also important to remember that back in those early conventions, a lot different than now, is that you had a considerable veto power over who the nominee would be. Uh, for instance, the Democratic Party required a two-thirds majority to nominate a, a candidate. And you often saw at these conventions multiple, multiple ballots. Uh, 
10, 20, 30, 50 ballots for somebody to finally get the nomination. Now our actual nomination vote, when you watch the conventions in the summer, it's a foregone conclusion. We know who the nominee is. The delegates are pledged to that nominee. We know it in advance. It's just uh, largely for show by that time. So let's move on a bit to the idea of presidential primaries. And what is a presidential primary? It's a, it's a system in which the voters of a state, because all of our elections are state-based according to the Constitution, the voters of the state choose delegates to their party's convention. They're not necessarily voting for the candidate. That's the formula. But essentially, you're voting for a delegate to your party's convention, the people who will represent you at the party's convention. These originated as a reform in the early part of the 1900s as part of the uh, the progressive era reforms that we saw um, um, coming largely out of the Midwest, but really uh, going all the way across the country, including things like uh, uh, professional civil service, um, primary elections. Uh, in, in some states, you saw the institution of, of, um, of uh, the, the, um, the process in which voters can uh, vote for actual bills, um, so, uh, th that sort of thing. Um, and what we saw is the idea of a primary, though, was to give voters and more, of a, more of a stake, more of a say in who their party's nominee was going to be. So have actual voters in there to make it more democratized. And Wisconsin was the first state to have a presidential primary back in 1908. And if you study the progressive era, you'll see the name of Robert La Follette, uh, who was a, a, a famous progressive from Wisconsin. He uh, really pushed for this in 1905, and it caught on very quickly. So by um, uh, Pennsylvania adopted one in 1906, South Dakota by 1909, Oregon by 1910, and even by 1916, 26 states had presidential primaries. So it caught on pretty quickly. They liked the idea of presidential primaries. Now, New Hampshire didn't have the first primary. We weren't assigned the first primary slot. It really developed over time. And it kind of is a happenstance thing, actually. Uh, we had our first state primaries in, 2000, in, in 1910, and that was really for governor and other state offices, but it did not include a presidential primary. And we didn't have our, our first presidential primary in uh, really until 1916, but in 1912, the Republican Party had this kind of quasi-presidential primary. It was just the party. It was run by the party. It was kind of a hybrid party convention. Now, New Hampshire, the first bill that talks about this was uh, HB 430. It's called the Bullock Act, named after its, its founder, uh, a gentleman named Stephen Bullock, who was a state representative from Richmond, New Hampshire. Anybody from Richmond? Small town. Uh, but it was basically an act to provide for the election of delegates to the National Convention by direct vote of the people. It, he first set the date for the third Tuesday in May 1916, but New Hampshire, being a frugal state, said, you know, let's think about this. There was a, a, a piece of legislation that was introduced by John Glesner of Bethlehem, New Hampshire, and he changed the primary date from May up to town meeting day, which at that time is the second Tuesday in March. Now, why would you move it to town meeting day? For cheap. Yeah. Because everyone's getting together anyway. Can you go ahead and use the microphone? Give me a good answer here. You can think about it as you walk up there. Because everyone's getting together anyway, so it would save money. Saves money, exactly. Um, these old town halls, if you grew up in New Hampshire in a small town hall, it's an old wooden building. It doesn't have a heater if it's often heated by a wood stove. So why would you spend the money to heat the darn building twice when you could do it once in March? So well, we ended up with the primary first because we were cheap. Or frugal, I guess would be. Yankee frugality. So with the, um, the early primary, we had our first primary in 1916. Indiana in 1916 had one a week earlier. So we weren't the first even in 1916. Minnesota had one the same day as us in, in uh, 1916. But by 1920, Indiana said enough of this early primary. They moved their primary back to May. 
which if you were from Midwestern states, May primaries are fairly typical. Uh, Minnesota said, uh, we don't even want to have primaries anymore. They went back to a caucus. And the reason they went back to a caucus was the turnout was low. And this is something that plagued the New Hampshire primary and other state primaries throughout the early part, the early half of the 20th century. So by 1920, Minnesota's gone, Indiana's gone, New Hampshire's still having its primary on town meeting day. We have the first primary in the country by default. We didn't plan it that way, it just ended up that way. And that's an important point when you think about states that want to move ahead of New Hampshire. Why is New Hampshire so special to have the New Hampshire primary first? Well, nobody else really wanted it first, is, is the early answer. So if you think of those early New Hampshire primaries from 1916, 1920, up through and after World War II, nobody really paid any attention to those things. Uh, we are a small state. We didn't have many delegates. If you were a candidate that, that had precious time to campaign, why would you bother to go to New Hampshire when you can spend, you could do a whole lot better by spending your time in one of the larger states. Um, voters didn't get to vote for the candidate. They voted for delegates. And the delegates were typically local politicians, state politicians, well-known figures. And most of the time, those delegates were not committed to a candidate. They were uncommitted delegates. They were open, they were, you know, they, it wasn't as if you could vote for your person by proxy voting for a delegate. Um, it wasn't that way. And then the other thing that happened was turnout wasn't very good. Not many people voted in, in, in those elections. This, again, is the major reason that other states have dropped the primary. So what we ended up with is a speaker of the House, New Hampshire House, Robert Upton, who's often referred to as the father of the primary, said, we got to do something to try to increase interest in our primary. Turnout's low. People aren't paying much attention to it. Is there anything we can do here? So what Upton did was introduce a bill in 1949, and he amended the primary law so that the ballot now would have the names of the delegates who you could vote for, but also have the names of the presidential candidates listed. And you, could, you would separately vote for the delegates as well as voting for the candidate that you preferred. People called this a beauty contest because the people that you said you were going to vote for, the, the actual presidential candidate, that didn't count. The only thing that counted was the delegate vote. The delegate vote was what mattered. Um, the delegates were still chosen by the votes they received. This went into effect in the 1952 primary. And there's some politics that goes with this. Uh, 1952, uh, Sherman Adams was the governor of New Hampshire. Big Eisenhower supporter. Now, at that time, people didn't know if Eisenhower was a Republican or a Democrat. But there was efforts by both parties to draft Eisenhower to be their presidential candidate. And Adams figured that he could push Eisenhower, he could get Eisenhower into the New Hampshire primary. It would be a big vote for him because he's a popular guy. He, went, he was the general that led uh, U.S. forces in, um, in um, uh, the Allied forces in Europe during World War II. He, of course, is going to win. So he figured that this would give him a chance to maybe get a, a leg up politically. And that fortuitous timing of the New Hampshire primary in 1952 when this bill uh, went into effect was really important in the later development of the New Hampshire primary because we saw at that same election the real beginnings of television and television news in 1952. So you had newscasters coming up to cover this quaint New Hampshire primary. Nothing else to talk about about the presidential election. It's the middle of March. We've got this New Hampshire primary. Send a team up there, figure out what's going on in New Hampshire. So it got some national attention that way. The other thing that happened in 1952 was we had really two very, very interesting races. The Eisenhower race uh, was the first one. With Adams' help, Eisenhower wins New Hampshire. He beats Bob Taft from Ohio uh, by 50% to 39%, and he goes on from there to become uh, the, the Republican nominee. On the Democratic side, there was also a really historic election as well. Harry Truman is the president in 1952. Uh, there was uh, an amendment to the Constitution passed in the wake of uh, FDR, uh, his four elections to reverse, the, to, to limit the president to two terms. Well, Harry Truman was grandfathered into that. He could run for president in 1952. In the 1952 primary, 
he loses to Estes Kefauver from Tennessee. He loses by 50 to 44 percent. He soon announces after that that he is not going to run for president in 1952. So it's an instance in which a sitting president really gives up an opportunity to continue his presidency based on what happens, in part based on what happens in New Hampshire. So New Hampshire gets this reputation as a kingmaker after the 1952 election. And now we have New Hampshire as the kingmaker and the press is paying attention to this. Um, the only other major change that we've had to the New Hampshire primary in terms of how it is officially run is that by 1976 we got rid of the idea that you were voting for a delegate and you just voted for the candidate. So we no longer vote for delegates anymore. You vote for delegates essentially, you vote for the candidate and then whatever the proportion of votes that the candidate gets, and it's slightly different on the Democratic side and the Republican side, and we'll talk about that later in class, but whatever proportion of the votes that the candidates get, or on the Republican side, in some states it's winner take all, you get that many delegates committed to your candidate at going to the convention. So that's the change. So. We, we, the political part of this is, this picture has uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the middle, uh, Governor Hugh Gregg on the right, the tall gentleman, and the guy with the kind of smile on his face over here, that's Sherman Adams. Sherman Adams went on after helping Eisenhower win that election in 1952 to become Eisenhower's chief of staff, an incredibly powerful position. He's not the only person who's done that. We'll talk about a little bit later on in the uh, 1980, uh, the, the, um, um, the 1988 election uh, between George Herbert Walker Bush and Bob Dole, uh, there was a governor, John H. Sununu, who helped uh, uh, President Bush then become, or Vice President Bush, be, uh, win the nomination. And he too went down to Washington to become uh, the chief of staff uh, for President Bush. So there is a real uh, opportunity uh, for somebody who really makes a president or really contributes to a president's victory in New Hampshire to have a much longer career in, 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 in politics down in Washington. So chief of staff is a very important position. So, now, what this is, this isn't an actual ballot, but this gives you an idea of what you were doing back in 1952. This was a, a, a flyer that was put out, it's like a sample ballot that was put out by the Eisenhower people. It says vote for I Ike, but you can see the names of the people and the towns that they're from, the delegates that you actually vote for. So here they're telling you to vote for uh, the following 10 delegates at large who are favorable to Eisenhower. Notice it doesn't say they're committed to Eisenhower, but they're favorable to Eisenhower. And the top of the list is Sherman Adams, uh, Robert Blood. You can look down here and you see some other names that are fairly uh, famous in New Hampshire, Dwayne Squires, uh, Foster Stearns, uh, Mr. Stalton Stahl. Uh, names that uh, come up quite a bit, Norris Cotton, if you've been out in the western part of the state, you know the Norris Cotton Medical Center, uh, important people in the state. So you can get a sense of what you had to do then. The other thing quirky about New Hampshire is uh, early on we started to develop this uh, sense for who gets to go first. There's an a old saying, heart's location first in the nation. Now, Hart's location is one of the smallest towns in New Hampshire. It's that little sliver of red which sits up there in Carroll County and essentially makes up Crawford Notch. And if you've driven up uh, Route 302 from Conway or North Conway up over towards the Mount Washington Hotel, it's one of the most beautiful places in the state of New Hampshire. And essentially nobody lives there. It's in the middle of the White Mountains National Forest. But there was a law, and they're still on the books, that in New Hampshire, if you are a small town with less than 100 voters, you can have people vote any time during the day. And what Hart's location did was, uh, and the, the woman there, uh, Florence Morey, said she wanted to get some national attention for this little town of Hart's location. So she said, we'll have the voting start at midnight, 12.01 on election day. So they opened the polls at 12.01 of course, did get a lot of media attention. Uh, it got so much media attention that by 1964, they quit doing it. At that time, Hart's location had about 20 people living in it, and they got bothered so much by the press that they said, enough, I don't want to be pestered by you. you can, somebody else can do this first. So the other first in the nation spot, first place in New Hampshire to vote, is now Dixville Notch, New Hampshire. Now Dixville Notch um, is another beautiful spot up in the mountains. 
Uh, but Dixville Notch is essentially not a town as much as it is a hotel. Uh, if any of you have been to the Balsams Hotel up in Dixville Notch, uh, beautiful spot. They have the ballot room with the official ballot box there. You can see in the picture down below where people would vote at just after midnight. And the voting process takes about five minutes because there's only about 30 voters up there. Uh, and the gentleman that you see there is the same gentleman as we have here, Neil Tillotson. Uh, Neil Tillotson uh, lived a, a very long life, 102 years old, and he uh, claimed or asserted that he was the first voter in the country for president from 1952 up until uh, he and through the 2000 election. Um, he had that right for a couple reasons was in, in, in Dixville Notch they let the oldest person in town vote first and since he lived to 102 there weren't many people older than him throughout that time and the second thing was he owned the hotel so if you're having the the election at your hotel and everyone else who's voting was working for you I guess they would give him pride of place and, and let him vote first so uh, Neil Tillotson rather uh, Famous minor celebrity in New Hampshire has to be famous enough, though, to be able to get a bobblehead made after him. And you can get these at the New Hampshire Historical Society. So I mentioned that um, things haven't changed too much in New Hampshire other than we dropped voting for delegates in 1976. But there were significant changes nationwide between 1968 and 1972 in how the parties chose their nominee for president. Now, the, the most significant thing, if you remember, uh, in the 1968 election, uh, there was the Vietnam War going on. We had a real uh, strong anti-war movement in the United States. There were riots across the country. There were riots at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And Hubert Humphrey, who became the Democratic nominee in 1968, did not run in a single caucus or primary for president. He was picked in the proverbial smoke-filled room by the leaders of the Democratic Party to be their party's nominee in, uh, in 1968. So not much Democratic about it. There was a commission that was set up after that, in the wake of that um, election, to do something about this. It's called the McGovern-Fraser Commission. And the McGovern person comes into play a little bit later. That's George McGovern. Um, so the mcgovern Fraser Commission comes back, and they essentially write rules for the Democratic Party that says the party will have, you'll either have a caucus or a primary in how you choose your candidates. Uh, there's some other rules that go in, but basically it, it's, it makes states now have primaries and caucuses for the, choosing who the Democratic delegates are going to be for the convention. Big change. You're not going to have the smoke-filled rooms anymore. Now primaries become much, much more important. And the first primary, obviously, becomes more important than it had been in the past. So what this led to, because you have more primaries and caucuses, more people voting, other states really don't have experience with primaries and caucuses. Very few states do. New Hampshire's first in the country, and New Hampshire, as we see um, in, in uh, 1976, 1980, whoever wins New Hampshire tends to get the nomination for your party. Well, other states say, we don't like that. We want to get a piece of that action, too. We don't want New Hampshire and then later on Iowa to have that much influence as to who our nominee is going to be. So what we want to do is we're going to move our primaries up earlier in the schedule, closer to New Hampshire, or in some cases they would want to move ahead of New Hampshire, to get the attention that New Hampshire to get, has, to get the political influence that New Hampshire has and steal it away from the state of New Hampshire. So this process is called front loading. Front loading. That's the process of moving primaries up earlier in the, uh, in the election calendar. And there's a lot of reasons for front loading. First off, states think they get more influence if they're at the head of the, the, the selection process. They think they get more money too. Now, there's, a, there's somewhat of a myth out there, and you read the Swenson article, which looked at an economic impact analysis of the 2008 Iowa um, uh, uh, caucuses. Uh, but there's a myth that the New Hampshire primary is bringing in gobs of money to the state. What was the, that Swenson says, how much money does the Iowa caucuses bring in roughly in the state of Iowa in that, that year that he was looking at? In the quarter, 
I think it was like um, thir uh, $31 million or something like that. There was an economic analysis done in New Hampshire after the 2000 primary cycle. And they looked at the whole four-year cycle from 90, you know, 97 through 2000, calculated the amount of money that candidates spent, the amount of money that other people might have spent coming into the state using some estimates, and then even using some multipliers to try to guess how much this would be worth. And it came out to be somewhere north of $300 million that the New Hampshire primary brought into New Hampshire in that window, that four-year window, which sounds a good chunk of change. It's a lot of money. We have two NASCAR races every year. Those two NASCAR races each year bring in more money and have a greater economic impact than the New Hampshire primary does. <laughs> that's not to diminish the importance of the New Hampshire primary, but to put in perspective, that's not a huge impact on the overall state budget. Now, for certain industries, it's huge. Um, we do polling for WMUR in, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, and if you've been by their building down there in, uh, uh, in, in Manchester, it's a very nice new building. Some people call it the, you know, the house that Steve Forbes built because in the 1996 campaign he spent so much money on television advertising that uh, WMUR had a pretty good year and could afford to expand their offices quite a bit. Uh, so some certain businesses make money. Uh, television, newspapers, uh, if you're in a catering business or if you have restaurants or hotel business at the very end. Uh, so you can make some money there but it's not like it's widespread across the state. In fact, in during campaigns, a lot of the money that supposedly is going for a campaign in New Hampshire is actually being spent in other places. So there's a tremendous amount of television advertising that goes on, but it's in Boston. And New Hampshire's not getting too much of the impact of that. Um, a lot of the people who work for campaigns, they may be getting paid when they're working in New Hampshire, but they live in Washington. So the money's not really staying here. So the economic impact, while it's a lot of money and it's good for the businesses that get it, it's not that huge. Um, but states still think that there must be buckets of money that's coming into New Hampshire and therefore we want to get a piece of that action too. Parties like front-loaded primaries because most of the time, almost always, they get the process over faster. The nominee is chosen faster. And that's a big advantage to a party because it means that they don't have to spend as much money beating up on each other and having the Democrats beaten up on Democrats, they can save that money and spend it against the Republicans for the November election. So it saves them a tremendous amount of money. Now in 2008, obviously we had a very different event. It's the first time in, in recent years, really since the 1976 primary, where the primary went on for a long time, all the way into, uh, into the summer, uh, late uh, spring and summer months. Um, but that was really unusual, an unusual election. Most of the time with front loading, it's over faster. And, and work that you will read and we'll have um, um, Professor uh, Bill Mayer from Northeastern is going to come and talk about front loading, the impact of front loading. The, the, the academic research shows that front loading actually diminishes the importance of states when they try to move up closer to New Hampshire because there's very little campaigning that's actually done in those states. It's the momentum that comes out of New Hampshire tends to be the only thing that people in those subsequent states see. So, you know, you're going to vote for somebody for president. How do you know if you want to have a good person? You know, how do you know if somebody's going to make a good president? What's the most important thing you want out of your candidate for president? You want somebody who can win, right? You want somebody who can beat the other guy's nominee. Well, how do you know if somebody's a winner? Winners win. Losers lose. If you win New Hampshire and you're in South Carolina or Florida or you know, Georgia, some other state, maybe the only thing you know about a particular candidate other than their name is that they won New Hampshire. And those people up in New Hampshire, they've seen these guys for a long time, so I guess that must mean he's okay. So you see the momentum build from people who win the early states, and it usually makes them just kind of cruise through the other states, that wave of momentum. We'll talk a lot more about momentum later on in the class and the importance of momentum. So states have been moving their um, primaries closer to what they call the, the window, the election window, which is set by the parties. The window refers to this time frame in which parties say that the states can conduct, the parties within the states can conduct their um, primaries or caucuses. And the window this time, uh, uh, the official window for the Republican Party, I think, begins 
on um, uh, New Hampshire has an exemption like February 14th and Iowa to February 8th. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's when the elections are actually going to happen. States notoriously push themselves up in the window and they shove people out because largely the parties can't really control when a state sets its primary. So um, the parties can't really stop the states from front loading. We'll talk about how that was attempted in New Hampshire. Uh, and how uh, other uh, states have done that more so uh, down the road, but uh, you really can't do much about it. But states haven't stopped trying to move themselves fr uh, closer to the front of the, the line. Uh, this front loading really got going underway in 1980, and it's and it's been going on ever since. So the impact of front loading, as I mentioned, the first thing is the you get an earlier selection of the nominee. Parties like it, but uh, you often have problems with buyer's remorse. You wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, this guy's our candidate. Um, there was a lot of buyer's remorse in 1996 for Bob Dole. He spent a lot of money. Uh, Republicans were very enthusiastic about him. He gets clobbered in the, in the, uh, uh, the 1996 election by Bill Clinton. Um, it costs a lot more to campaign early. If you're going to have a number of states that are up all at the early part of the uh, the, the primary window, that means you have to raise a lot, of more mon a lot more money because you as a candidate now have to campaign in multiple states. You're not just going to Iowa and New Hampshire. You're going to Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Michigan, Nevada, Florida, all right away. And some of those states are pretty big, require a lot of money. It's harder to do. That means if you're going to be a credible candidate, you have to start raising money for your presidential bid a year or two earlier. You really have to get a lot more money. And it hurts the little guy. Uh, New Hampshire kind of prides itself largely on the, uh, the 1976 nomination of, of Jimmy Carter and also for people like uh, uh, Gary Hart in 1984 and um, Pat Buchanan in 1996, uh, John McCain in 2000 as a place where the front runner the party favorite doesn't always win. It's a place where an, a little guy can do well. But as front loading increases, it makes it more and more difficult for that to happen. Pretty much you have to be a well-funded, well-known candidate to have a chance in any of the early states because you're campaigning essentially across the country. It also means that you have a loss of individual contact, a voter contact um, that New Hampshire in particular is famous for. Uh, there's a little joke about a um, uh, guy asked his buddy, who's he going to vote for in the New Hampshire primary? The, uh, and asked him if he likes uh, candidate X. And he said, well, I don't know. I've only met him five times. Now, to a great extent, that's a myth. But there is something to be said that in New Hampshire, if you want to, you can meet every one of the candidates for president very easily, multiple times if you want to. So if you've got an interest in politics, you can do that. But as you have more front-loading, and the candidates are now spread out across multiple states, voters have less opportunity to do that. Not just in New Hampshire, but in the other states as well. The most valuable thing, the most important thing that any candidate has during an election is their time. You can raise more money, but you can't create more time for a candidate. So there's less face time for the candidates. Um, that results in lower voter knowledge about what the candidates are what they're all about, what their platforms are. And that means also you have less chances, as I mentioned, of getting an outsider candidate, of getting the nomination. So we've seen this front-loading effort. We've seen states push to the front of the line, try to get New Hampshire out of the way. How does New Hampshire stay number one? How does it stay the first primary? Well, there, there's a number of reasons, and I'm going to go through some of these, but I will, we'll focus on the procedural reasons um, for, the, for the next part of the, the, the lecture. First off, the media like New Hampshire. It's small. It's photogenic, easy to get around. You can fly into Manchester and essentially get to uh, where three-quarters of the population lives within about 45-minute drive. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, so they know the most scenic backdrops. They know the diners that they need to go to. They know the town halls that look pretty. They know where the historic events took place. Also, and this is not a, a dish so much to Iowa, but if it's January, would you rather be in New Hampshire, where you've got pretty mountains and you can go skiing, or in Iowa, where you might be faced with a ground blizzard? Um, you know, it's, 
New Hampshire is a, uh, is a more attractive place to go. It's easier to do. Uh, it's small, so the candidates like it, too. Candidates can get everywhere in the state. A candidate can fly into Manchester, and he can hit a big chunk of the voters in the state or towns where these voters live within a couple days and get out. So it's easy for a candidate to schedule lots of events. And because we've been doing the primary for such a long time, the people who like to host these events, local parties or local polls, they do it really well. They can do it very easily. Have a house party? Sure, I'll throw a house party for you. How many people do you want to show up? 50 people? No problem. I'll get 50 people for you. It's easy to do. It's a parlor game. You know, it's a, a sport for a lot of people. It's cheap to get in to New Hampshire. It's over $1,000 to get in. It's one reason, if you look, we'll talk more about fringe candidates in New Hampshire down the road. There are a lot of people that will put up 1000 bucks and get on the ballot. Uh, I don't know if you remember Lobster Man. That was one guy that would run. There was Vermin Supreme who would campaign with a boot on his head. Uh, we had all sorts of colorful people who uh, get into the New Hampshire primary, which kind of adds a little bit more spice to the campaign. And the press will do some uh, coverage on these guys. This makes it interesting. We have high turnout in New Hampshire. And this is, makes New Hampshire a real test compared with a lot of other states. In the 2008 presidential primaries in New Hampshire, about 51% of the adult population in the state voted. And it comes close to 59, 60% of the registered voters in the state voted. Some states don't get that kind of turnout in presidential election years. We have higher turnout in our presidential primary than we have in our midterm elections. Very unusual. Iowa, Republican primaries, Iowa, you might get 15, 20% in Iowa. South Carolina, 25, 30%. We have significantly higher turnout than other states. That's very important because it means that it's not activists who nominate the parties who, who uh, win the election for a candidate here. It's regular voters, voters who don't pay as much attention to politics, who aren't single issue voters, who aren't really motive, uh, who aren't as ideological, and it, that means it reflects more of a general election, a November election electorate. So if you can do well in New Hampshire and pull in a lot of these regular folks that aren't activists, it really indicates that you've got a greater chance of doing well in a general election because it means that you're not just appealing to the activists. Um, another, so, and, and, and candidates know that. A another reason is we've got this kind of wild card with the New Hampshire primary. We have what's called a semi-closed primary in New Hampshire. If you're registered as a Republican, you can only vote in the Republican primary. If you're registered as a Democrat, you can only vote in the Democratic primary. But if you're registered, what's technically called undeclared, you can vote in either primary. And about 40% of the registered voters in New Hampshire are registered undeclared. Well, again, we'll talk about this later on. That doesn't mean that they're up in the air. That doesn't mean that they're free agents. Most of the undeclareds are either Republicans or Democrats. But they do have a choice. So that means that in any election cycle, you have to figure out how do I design a campaign to appeal to these undeclared independent voters? How many of them are there going to be? Who's going to show up? In 2012, we're not going to have a, a real Democratic primary campaign. So are those, Demo are those independents who might have otherwise voted Democrat, are they going to stay home? Are they going to vote? in the Republican primary. And if they are going to vote in the Republican primary, who are they going to vote for? Are they going to kind of vote for the weakest candidate to try to sabotage the party? These sorts of storylines get played out every year. And you know, smart, smart campaign folks know how to cut through it, but the media love those sorts of stories. So there, that's another reason I think New Hampshire stayed number one. But the major reason that New Hampshire has kept its status as the first in the nation primary is, is because it's the law and Bill Gardner, the Secretary of State, is the enforcer of that law. New Hampshire is required by law to have, the, uh, uh, have its primary one week before any similar state contest. So when another state moves its primary up to the same day as New Hampshire or ahead of New Hampshire, uh, the Secretary of State says, okay, we just have to move ours up a week before them. And it creates some interesting dynamics, and I'll let the Secretary of State talk about that uh, later on this week. But it's, um, I want to go through some of these things now, so things for you that you can talk with him about. So first thing that happened was in 1972, Iowa slips through, much to the chagrin of people in New Hampshire ever since. 
But in 1972, Iowa had its caucus. They moved it up to January. But people in New Hampshire ignored this because they said it's not a primary, it's a caucus. It's not the same thing. Nobody votes in caucuses. Primaries are very different. They're a different animal. Um, since that time, I think a lot of people have wished that uh, we would not have let that happen and, and, and done something to stop that, but it occurred. Uh, and it also occurred before the law was passed in New Hampshire saying that we had to have the first in the nation primary. But also in 1972, Florida tried to move its primary up to the same day as New Hampshire. And the argument was, you know, where would you rather be in the wintertime, campaigning in New Hampshire or in Florida? Well, yeah, I could see the difference between New Hampshire over Iowa, but New Hampshire over Florida. And we got a big chunk of our population goes to Florida every every uh, uh, winter. It's a nice, it's a little bit nicer to be down there. But um, New Hampshire passed a law to move its primary a week earlier in March. So originally it was on town meeting day, the second Tuesday in March. The legislature passed the law, moved it up a week earlier. So now we were a week ahead of Florida, and still number one. Nineteen seventy six, Massachusetts tries to move in front of New Hampshire. We know this is going to happen for the nineteen seventy six primary. So a uh, state rep, Jim Splain out of Portsmouth, and he'll come and talk to us later in the class as well and talk about all the, the, the machinations around this. But uh, he introduces a law to officially separate the primary from town meeting day. You know, historically, ever since the first New Hampshire primary in nineteen sixteen, we've had it on town meeting day. Uh, 1972 was the first time it wasn't on town meeting day, but we thought that might have been a one-off. This law gives the Secretary of State the ability to separate the two there. And so we changed it to, uh, to be the first Tuesday in March or on the Tuesday immediately preceding any other New England state uh, that shall hold a similar election, whichever is earlier. So we said, okay, no other New England state is going to get in front of us. The more important thing that this piece of legislation did was it gave the Secretary of State the authority to set the date of the primary. And this is interesting here because there were people in the legislatures who said, wait a minute, we shouldn't let the Secretary of State do that. That should be something that the legislature does. And the legislature usually passes laws in most states that sets the date of their primary or their caucus. But uh, the governor at that time, Meldrum Thompson, and some people within the the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the state legislature said, no, what we want to do is we want to remove partisan politics from the process. The Secretary of State is elected by the state legislature. It's not voted on by the public. He's elected by the state legislature. Bill Gardner was a Democrat originally, but he was elected by Republicans when he first ran in 1976. So it's, and he's really held it as a kind of a nonpartisan position there. So they were able to keep the um, um, uh, politics out of that process, I mean politics, partisan politics. Um, Mr. Gardner will absolutely talk about all of the politics that goes on in the setting of the date, but try to keep partisan politics on it. Have Republicans and Democrats working together to protect the New Hampshire's number one in the nation status. So 1976, I mentioned Bill Gardner's elected Secretary of State. He's still Secretary of State, it's that 35 years later. He uh, is the longest serving Secretary of State in the nation right now. Uh, he may be, I'll have to, we can ask him about this on Thursday, he may be the longest serving Secretary of State in U.S. history. He's really close to that. So he takes this job very seriously and really protects the primary. But um, that doesn't stop other states from saying, well, we still want to ho uh, horn in on New Hampshire's first in the nation status. So 1977. We respond to some other challenges. We make change in the legislation so it says that the first Tuesday in March or on the Tuesday immediately preceding any other state. We drop the New England part now. So we're looking at it a bit more broadly. We have to be a week before any other state. Um, 1980, Puerto Rico has a Republican primary. They move it up to February 17, 1980. But uh, Bill Gardner ignores it. He says, I have the authority to set the date. But uh, Puerto Rico is not a state. We're not going to pay attention to them. Probably did him well because it might have looked pretty petty if you're worried about setting your primary before uh, you know, a, a state or before somebody that's not even a state. 
Then we start playing chicken with the Democratic National Committee in 19, uh, up for the 1984 election. Um, in 1983, the DNC sets its schedule for the New Hampshire primaries, and they say that no state can have it earlier than the second Tuesday in March. But Vermont says, oh, we can't have it earlier than the second Tuesday in March. We'll schedule ours on that day, the same day as New Hampshire. So Bill Gardner says, well, I guess we're going to have to set ours a week earlier. And the DNC comes in in a person named Nancy Pelosi, who was a DNC representative at the time, comes in, flies in with the delegation. They meet with the Secretary of State. They have a discussion. And the Secretary of State says, well, state law says I have to move it up earlier. And, and uh, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi has a quote saying, you're a young man, and uh, you, you have a future in politics. Don't throw it away on something like this. Um, Bill Gardner still the Secretary of State. He moves the primary to February 28th. And uh, the threat that the Democrat, that the DNC used was that if you don't, if you violate our window, we won't seat your delegates at our convention. New Hampshire moves up early. Guess what? New Hampshire delegates were seated at the convention. The reason this is a hollow threat by the parties is by the time the primary season is over, and you had sometimes very divisive primaries like Democrats had in 2008. What is it that you want to do? You want to heal those wounds. You want to get everybody singing together off the same hymn book page. You want everybody to be fighting the opposite party. You don't want to carry on ugly disputes into the convention. So it's usually a hollow threat. And we saw in 2008, Michigan and Florida, they got to have their delegates seated with a little bit of angst there, but they still were seated. So it's a hollow threat to keep the delegates out of the convention. We still have more challengers. They don't learn their lesson. 1988, um, we move our primary to the third Tuesday in, uh, in February because South Dakota scheduled the primary early. So we move ourselves in, in front of South Dakota. In 1992, we move it to the second Tuesday in February, or excuse me, the third Tuesday in February again, one week ahead of South Carolina, which tried to jump in. So you can see we're constantly, uh, Bill Gardner is essentially just following the law and moving it one week ahead of any similar state, any similar contest. Uh, and uh, a lot of people think that Gardner's got some ulterior motives and he's hard to read and figure out when he's gonna set the date. But in reality is, he just looks to see when other people are going to set the date and does it one week earlier. It's not too difficult to figure out. Um, by 1996, both Arizona and Delaware move up. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's good with Arizona. Arizona actually adopts the language that New Hampshire has in its law, saying that they will be one week ahead of any similar one. So you've got two states really playing chicken with one another. Eventually, Arizona backs down. There's a great quote by uh, Jeff Groscott, who was a, um, a, a state rep from Mesa, Arizona. He says, I don't mind playing chicken, but I have an aver a certain aversion to playing chicken when there is no reasonable expectation that we could win. So they back down as well. Delaware was a little bit interesting. This is something where politics came into play. Uh, and here, there was a lot of effort by people within um, the Republican Party to put pressure on the actual candidates to not campaign in Delaware. And they essentially stopped the, new, the Delaware primary by getting commitments from the Republican candidates not to campaign there. And the reason they did that was, they said, if they're going to campaign in Delaware, those people in New Hampshire aren't going to like that very much. And if you don't win New Hampshire, what are your chances of becoming the nominee? Minimal. So New Hampshire had that thread of momentum that they could build from winning New Hampshire and the lack of momentum by ticking off the voters in New Hampshire to keep Delaware from being able to schedule its primary. So um, the candidates largely refused to participate in the Delaware primary. And you still get more challengers. So in 1999, we changed the law again, uh, gave the Secretary of State even more flexibility uh, to move the primary to any Tuesday, seven days before any similar election. South Carolina sets its primary for Saturday, February 19th. So what do we do? We move ours up to February 8th. That's more than seven days, but it has to be on a Tuesday. So we have to take it the Tuesday that's more than seven days before the other, the other state. Michigan threatens a move to February 8th. They back down as well. 
So you can see this pattern playing out as well. 2000 is actually one of the more interesting one. Um, uh, 2000 isn't so good. They, 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 uh, when South Carolina moves theirs up, uh, Iowa gets upset because they thought they had theirs already scheduled and so forth, and they didn't want to move and change things. And um, what they did was they, they had made a claim that they couldn't move it eight days in front of New Hampshire because Iowa has a similar law to New Hampshire. Can't move theirs up because there's this pork producers convention. And some people ask what kind of pork is being produced. But uh, this pork producers convention that was going to be taking over every hotel room in the state of Iowa. And of course, we couldn't have the, 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 the caucuses that week because of this, all these people that were in town. Uh, this really ticked off people in New Hampshire. Even the Concord Monitor says that, well, this is New Hampshire's time. Just go ahead. We'll move it in front of Iowa. Heck with them. Because before this time, Iowa and New Hampshire worked together pretty good to keep each other's spot in the, in the process um, uh, in, in, in place. But Iowa eventually backs down. They moved their, uh, their um, uh, caucuses to January 24th. The, uh, the big pork convention turned out to be a relatively small affair that took place in one town for a couple days. So it really wasn't a big thing at all. But you know, they were working with what they had, is what they said, in terms of using a threat against New Hampshire. Uh, so the, the Great Port Convention turned out not to be a big thing. So Happy New Year, 2008. This is when things really started pushing the envelope of, of, of silly. Uh, in 2008, Florida moves up its uh, primary, which means that South Carolina moves its up because now it's the first of the southern primaries, so now they're ahead of, a week ahead of Florida. But because South Carolina moves theirs up, that has to push New Hampshire up a week, which has to push Iowa up a week. And we almost push ourselves into 2007. So Iowa, in order to avoid having its primary in 2007, has to change their law and has their caucus on January 3rd. New Hampshire has its five days later. They didn't want to have it on, um, on uh, New Year's Day would have been a little bit difficult. Although if uh, they could have had um, uh, TVs if the Iowa Hawkeyes had been playing in a bowl game, they could have had a TV party as well as caucuses at the same event. But Iowa moves theirs to the third. New Hampshire has its on January 8th. So when is the 2012 primary going to be set for New Hampshire. Anybody know the date? Good you don't because it's a trick question. The date isn't set. Now the Republican Party has a scheduled date, a suggested date of February 14th. Probably is not going to happen. Um, already uh, Florida's on the books as, uh, as um, having theirs on uh, January 30th which would mean South Carolina would put theirs up earlier, and then New Hampshire would put theirs up earlier. We'd have the same sort of circus that we had in 2008. Um, secretaries of state are really working to try to not have that happen so that this is going on. Yeah? Oh. So we don't know when the 2012 primary is. Ask Secretary Gardner on Thursday what he thinks the date is going to be. Um, I don't think you'd say it in front of the cameras, but um, that's something we can have. So right now, what, what we have um, is the current law. This was passed in May of 2010, uh, HB 341. The presidential primary election shall be held on the second Tuesday in March or on a date selected by the Secretary of State, which is seven days or more immediately preceding the date on which any other state shall hold a similar election of each year when the President of the United States is to be elected or the year previous. So we've made some allowances to go into the earlier year. Uh, said primaries shall be held in connection with the regular March town meeting. We still have that kind of language in there about town meeting. Um, or, or election, if held on another day at a special election called by the Secretary of State for that purpose. And then they put in some specific language that defines what this means. It says, the purpose of this section is to protect the tradition of the New Hampshire first in the nation presidential primary. So it's very, very clear for people that not only is this the specific language of the law, but this is the intent of the law. So I mentioned, here's Bill Gardner. Um, he will set the, uh, he's a Secretary of State. He'll set the primary date sometime after the filing period for the primary. The filing period is the period in which candidates can go pay their thousand bucks and get on the ballot uh, 
uh, um, for the election. Um, the, filing, the, pri the, the filing period is scheduled for those dates right now. It may not be. He could even push that filing period later, which would give him some more flexibility in setting the date. New Hampshire has great flexibility. The Secretary of State has great flexibility in setting the date of the New Hampshire primary. Uh, most other states, because they require uh, legislation to set their primary caucus dates, are in a much more difficult spot. Uh, legislation means you have to have people in your capital. You have to have a vote. You have to have the governor willing to sign it. So there's some logistics that take place in those other states that we don't have to worry about. Uh, so we are playing chicken with a lot of other states, but we have a lot more tools in, in the Secretary of State's tool bag than the other states have. So I want to turn now, since we're talking about history here, we got in a little bit here to recent history and how it impacts modern elections. But we, we talked earlier about some of the historic elections in New Hampshire and the historic primary elections. There have been a lot of them. And I think this is one of the reasons that New Hampshire is still seen as a real special place uh, by the media and by candidates as well in the, in the nomination process. So we talked about the 1952 election when Eisenhower defeats Taft, Sherman Adams goes to D.C., uh, Keith Fowler defeats Truman, and uh, Truman goes back to independence. That's very historic. Very historic. President decides not to run. 1964, another historic election. Uh, and this one, it's the first one in which a write-in candidate wins. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who is a senator from Massachusetts, uh, runs a write-in campaign. He wins just barely. Uh, he comes in ahead of, um, of Barry Goldwater. But the thing that he does is he knocks Nelson Rockefeller out of the race. Nelson Rockefeller, a Northeastern Republican, thought that he could win the New Hampshire primary. That gave him a real inside track to winning the nomination, but he wasn't able to do it. So it split that moderate Republican vote. Goldwater went on to win other contests and became the Republican nominee in 1964. 1968, another one, really uh, an historic election. This is the Get Clean for Gene. Eugene McCarthy, senator from Minnesota, runs as an anti-war candidate. Uh, against LBJ in 1968. He recruits all of these college kids to come up here who couldn't vote, remember, in 1968. They weren't allowed to vote in, pres in presidential elections until uh, 1972. So he has all these kids who are politically active, they're politically motivated, but they don't have anything to do. So he gets these folks to work for his campaign, and the saying is, get clean for Gene, don't come up to New Hampshire with long beards and scraggly clothes and uh, uh, knock on doors and scare the natives. Get yourself cleaned up. Get your hair cut, shave your beard off, dress nicely with a jacket and tie, and then go out and campaign and show what nice young people you are. Now, Gene McCarthy, the, the, the myth is that McCarthy beat LBJ here and therefore that caused LBJ to choose not to run for president in 1968. Truth is, remember in 1968 we still had the dual system where you voted for delegates and you voted for the candidate. Well, on the beauty contest part, LBJ won 50% to 42%. The, the, the McCarthy people, though, they figured that they probably weren't going to be able to beat LBJ anyway. They were more doing it to make a point. But they figured if they had a chance to beat LBJ, what they need to do is concentrate on the delegates, get people to vote for the delegates. So they would say, yeah, you vote for whoever you want for president, and you vote for Johnson, that's fine. But if you're going to vote for a delegate, vote for these delegates. And they were successful enough that they won the delegate vote. So LBJ both won and lost in 1968. In either case, it really showed that he had significant problems within his own party which was one of the reasons that he pulled out and decided not to run in 1968. So, again, raising the impression that New Hampshire is a kingmaker or the place where a king can get knocked off. We move up to 1972. 1972 is a fascinating one. This is Ed Muskie, uh, senator from Maine. He's running, uh, thinks he's got a good chance because he's from a neighboring state. He wins New Hampshire, 46% to 37% but he wins by less than was expected. People thought that he would be able to knock out these other guys. George McGovern, South Dakota, nobody ever heard of a guy. 
But so what, what we saw here, this was a um, where where uh, Ed Muskie is standing in front of the union leader, who had written a scathing editorial criticizing his wife, and he's. The, the union leader said that he was crying out there. He says, no, 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 that was just snow. That was, you can see the snow coming down, snow in my eyes or so. But whatever the case, it left an impression in the minds of some people that he wasn't tough enough to be the leader of the United States during the Cold War while we've got wars going on in Vietnam and so forth. And uh, it probably hurt him somewhat. But he still won here, but didn't win in buying up. And we'll talk about the expectations game later on in the class, how ca uh, candidates try to uh, lower the expectations so they can exceed them and seem to be doing better than they actually do. Bill Clinton is, is famous for that one. Um, 1976, Jimmy who? Uh, Jimmy Carter walks into a uh, general store in, in Hooksett, New Hampshire. He says, hi, I'm Jimmy Carter. And the guy says, Jimmy who? Nobody knew who Jimmy Carter was. Jimmy Carter, though, figured out the importance of momentum and the early nominating states. The, the McGovern-Fraser reforms went into place in 1972. Not surprised that George McGovern won the Democratic nomination in 1972. He knew the system. But Carter figured out the system too. He concentrated on Iowa. He didn't win the Iowa caucus. Uncommitted, und uh, undecided won, uncommitted won, but he came in second. He used that as momentum coming to New Hampshire where he'd been campaigning essentially by himself for a long time and got momentum in New Hampshire, won the New Hampshire primary, and actually went on then to become the Democratic nominee, showing the importance of momentum and winning the early states. Go up to 1980, and I'm going to play, I don't have too many things to play, but this is a, a, a good one. 1980 was an important election because there was the Kennedy-Carter election in 1980, which really split the Democratic Party. Um, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy got 37. 37% of the vote against the sitting president and really wounded Jimmy Carter and made it was probably a major reason that he didn't get reelected in 1980. But uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, it comes up here. Ronald Reagan finishes second in 1976 to Gerald Ford, finishes second in the New Hampshire primary, and uh, ought to do pretty good here. Uh, he ends up winning by a 50 to 23% vote. And this is one of the memorable moments, moments from that primary. This is, a, hopefully, you can hear this. Um, I'll expand it up here. They don't. The fireworks begin. So that streak of anger there that, that Reagan showed was something that really galvanized his campaign and made him look as like a real forceful leader there and is arguably one of the tipping points there. So you can see this even, what's it, 30 years later. It's a pretty impactful moment on a campaign trail. And this is at a gym in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, small town. Pick up the microphone. Can you imagine that being done now or any place other than, say, New Hampshire or Iowa, where it's far less scripted than in, other, in these other states? 1984, we have another really interesting one. Um, Walter Mondale, the Democratic, uh, the chosen Democratic candidate, lines up all the union support and institutional support for the Democratic Party before he gets in, but he has this little senator from Colorado, Gary Hart, decides to run against him. Well, Gary Hart does second place in Iowa, doesn't win Iowa, but he claims that he did much better than anticipated. So comes to New Hampshire where he had been campaigning, thought he had a more favorable electorate here, and he wins the New Hampshire primary by 37% to 28%. This really weakened Walter Mondale again. That primary played out. Mondale had to fight against somebody from his own party for a long time. Hurt him, spent money, gave the uh, Reagan campaign more am ammunition. It's always better to take ammunition when somebody within your party is shooting at you than somebody outside of the party. It's more believable that way. So um, uh, Mondale loses in 1984, in part because he got beat up by Gary Hart in New Hampshire. 1992, we've got Bill Clinton. 
Bill Clinton's dogged by accusations of womenizing, of, of using drugs, of, of, of dodging the draft. But he runs in New Hampshire. He doesn't win. Loses by 33% to 24% to Paul Songa, senator from Massachusetts. But he famously claims that he did a whole lot better than anyone anticipated, calls himself the comeback kid, and goes on from there to win. So he's able to take advantage of those expectations. Now, the other important thing about 1996 is this is the first time that a candidate gets elected president without winning New Hampshire's primary since the modern primary cycle has begun. So that first, always first, always right, no chink in the armor after 96. Move up to uh, uh, 96 on the, uh, uh, after 92, 96 on the, de- on the Republican side, Pat Buchanan. Pat Buchanan ran in 1992 against George Bush. Lost in New Hampshire. Bush won, but wounded Bush and arguably caused Bush not to be able to get reelected in, in 92. But he comes back in 96, running against Bob Dole. He's, Bob Dole is not the, the best light guy. He didn't win in New Hampshire and all the times he's run for president. Um, but Pat Buchanan beats Bob Dole by 1% really wounds Dole. That campaign plays out all the way to the convention where you have Pat Buchanan giving a speech about the cultural war in, New, in, in the United States causing Republicans uh, a lot of problems and, and leading to a fairly easy win for Bill Clinton in the 96 presidential election. 2000. We've got more historic things. We've got uh, John McCain running the town hall campaign. Uh, McCain didn't have the kind of money that George W. Bush had. Bush got all of the institutional support and financial support from the Republican Party. McCain had shoe leather. So he came up here, campaigned a lot, held a lot of events with 100 to 200 people. His campaign did a good job organizing these events. And he would answer a lot of questions. And he seemed like a straightforward guy, willing to interact with people, whereas Bush at that time was missing a debate not wanting to interact with people, seeming afraid to get out there and mix it up with the real people and real voters in New Hampshire. So that's uh, set up this idea that that Bush wasn't tough enough. And McCain wins New Hampshire, but he wasn't able to overcome the institutional support that the Bush people had, similar to what uh, Mondale was able to do in in 1984. Um, And Bush becomes the second person to win the presidency without winning New Hampshire primary. Uh, there was also an historic primary on the, on the uh, Democratic side. Bill Bradley is running against the sitting Vice President Al Gore. And if it hadn't been for all of the um, attention that the McCain victory got, um, it might have been a very different outcome on the Democratic side because um, Gore only beat by Bradley by 49% to 45%. Very close race there. Um, 2004, we have Howard Dean. Howard Dean from the neighboring state of Vermont running against John Kerry from the neighboring state of Massachusetts. You notice there's a pattern here. Um, uh, By the fall of uh, of, uh, 2003 and early winter of 2004, Howard Dean's winning. He's doing some things that are making voters a little bit nervous, but he goes to Iowa and he had really banked on winning Iowa, spent a tremendous amount of money and time. He had kind of the get clean for gene strategy, except that he didn't send his uh, workers out there looking like get clean for gene guys. They had beards and tattoos and and, and nose piercings and so forth, wearing orange hunting hats. He thought that might make them appeal to people in Iowa. But I don't think think people were answering the door and saying, I'm not so sure about talking with these folks. Anyway, Dean loses Iowa. He has that historic screen at the um, uh, end of his... uh, a speech after the Iowa caucus, and he really collapses here. His support dropped 14 points in one day in our polling. So uh, he was going along, but his support was weak. He dropped, and that's an important thing because what it shows is that voters in New Hampshire, and in most primaries, they don't make up their minds until right near the end. And last-minute campaign events such as this can have a huge impact on what actually happens. Saw similar things in 2008. Um, McCain wins again on the, on the, on the uh, Republican side, but Clinton rebounds from losing to Obama. She gets beat up in a debate on Saturday night, um, uh, and then on Monday morning, uh, she's at a coffee shop in Portsmouth, and she 
chokes up and talks about how important this was for her. And that gets played over and over and over in the press that day. And the one group that shifted in its opinions from the pre-election polls to the post-election polls, the exit polls, were women who saw that they seemed to think that Clinton was getting beaten up on by the boys. And they shifted and she wins this historic election and, and goes on to pull things. So again, we'll talk about the impact of last minute changes and how people make up their minds at the end. This was really an indication of how that plays out in New Hampshire. You can't, the, the campaign in New Hampshire isn't over until it's over, really. Last minute things matter. So the things we want to talk about in New Hampshire. Each primary really has its own stories and its the own themes, its own rhythm and its own cycles, but there are certain trends that occur throughout the history of the New Hampshire primary. First trend is you can't ignore New Hampshire. Candidates who decide not to uh, campaign in New Hampshire and make it be known that they don't plan on campaigning in New Hampshire do poorly. Most recently we saw Rudy Giuliani's campaign fall apart. He was the front runner in all of the national polls throughout 2007 and finishes in fourth place in New Hampshire. Ron Paul almost beats him in New Hampshire and he goes on to fade away. Now he may run again this year, there's still a chance he could get in, and if he does I'm sure he'll run a better campaign than he did in 2008 and I'm sure he won't ignore New Hampshire this time around. So you can't ignore New Hampshire. Second thing is we've seen with the 2008 campaign and the 2004 campaign really point out, voters make up their minds at the end. There's really little difference between the candidates within a party's primaries on issue positions. They're almost identical or it's at best shades of gray and difference between them on policy positions. So you look at other things like their personalities, their history, do they, do they look good on TV, do they interact with you well? And those things, and then the other thing you pay attention to are last minute campaign events. The last minute, the last week is when voters really start paying attention. I use the analogy of going to the store to buy ice cream. If you leave the house with your kids or your parents, you're going to go get uh, an ice cream cone at the ice cream store, you don't leave the house saying, well, today I'm going out and get myself a black cherry ice cream cone, maybe some chocolate syrup on top. No, you walk out knowing that you're going to get some ice cream. You walk to the ice cream store, you look at the wall, you see what they've got on sale, what's the special. You see somebody else walking out with a butter pecan ice cream in their hand. You say, wow, that looks good. I haven't had one of those for a while. I think I'll get one of those. And the thing about it is when you go to the ice cream store, you know that it doesn't matter what kind of ice cream you eventually choose, you're going to be happy with it. You'll be happy with it. When you vote for a, a, a candidate in your presidential primary, it doesn't matter who wins, you're going to vote for that person in November. You're going to support that person. So you're going to be happy with the outcome eventually. So we, we tend to make the mistake that primaries are just slightly different varieties of general elections. When in reality, they're completely different animals. Um, another thing that we see is that New England candidates do much better than do candidates from other parts. They're better known, they know the, the state, and they fit in ideologically better with the state of New Hampshire. And the final point is that perception is more important than reality. It doesn't necessarily matter if you win or lose, it's the expectations that you set for yourself and how big you are going to win by or, or, or not win by that are more important. So we've covered a lot of ground here today. And the readings have a lot of this material in it. And the people that we'll be bringing in for the rest of the course will be able to help you answer these things. And they'll flesh these things out as well. But what I wanted to do today is make sure that you got a good background and understand the names of the people, the events, so it all is familiar to you when you hear this from other people. Any questions that you have so far today? You, yes, sir. You can get the microphone. I just had a question concerning the voter turnout in Iowa compared mm -hmm. to New Hampshire. You know, we are 50 to 60, and you said they're 20 to 30. Do you think um, with uh, a rich tradition it, for both states in terms of holding the caucus, in their case the primary and ours, do you feel like uh, it has more to do with the general level of political engagement in New Hampshire, or is it more uh, a factor of uh, the structure of a caucus mm -hmm. versus the structure of a... Uh, primary? Uh, an excellent question. I think it, it, a little bit of both. Um, Iowa has a caucus system. The Democratic caucus requires that you go to the caucus and, and go into a room with a few hundred other 
people from your precinct or your ward. And they're essentially you're in there for three or four hours. And they've got this weird system of you, know, you talk and give your speeches about why you should vote for your candidate. And then they want you to go to different parts of the room and line up with people in a public, public no, no secret ballot, but line up with the people of the candidate you support. And if the candidate that you like doesn't get 15% of the vote in the room, you have the opportunity to go align yourself with somebody else. And there's deals that are made and all sorts of stuff that goes on. It takes a long time. And you're right, that would depress turnout. Why would somebody want to do that, go after work in the evening and spend three, four hours hanging out with people they don't know and being publicly identified in, 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 uh, as to which candidate they support? But on the Republican side, they essentially have a primary. They walk in, they fill out a secret ballot, put in the box and leave. So there's no reason uh, that the Republican turnout should be that much lower than it is in New Hampshire from, an in, from a, um, a procedural uh, matter. But it is considerably lower than it is in New Hampshire. Uh, in, in, in 2008, the, and it's difficult to calculate specific numbers of, of who voted in what primary, but the estimates for the Republican primary are somewhere in the 11 and 19 percent range in, in 2008. So considerably lower than what we saw in New Hampshire. So I think part of it is that New Hampshire has a history and a tradition of, of, of a primary that's a longer. It's also, um, it, it's become something that you do in New Hampshire. It, it, it is a habit. There are, there, as I mentioned, there are more people who will vote in the New Hampshire presidential primary than vote in a midterm election. And the midterm elections obviously should be more important. You're choosing your governors and your congressmen and your senators and things like that. But more people will come out and vote in a presidential primary. So there is something about the event, the circus of the New Hampshire primary. And uh, if any of you have been in Manchester or Concord the week before the primary, you'll really appreciate that circus where every uh, TV network, not only in the United States, but from around the world are lined up. Uh, every politico that you've ever seen uh, on TV or an elected official is there. You can meet former presidents of the United States on the street because they're all out there campaigning. Uh, it's a real circus. And, and, and it's easy to do in New Hampshire because it's a more compact space. In a state like Iowa, it's a bigger state. You, you're just not exposed to the circus quite as much as you are in New Hampshire. Other questions? Yes? Okay. Um, both of the articles that we read mm -hmm. um, for homework address that New Hampshire hasn't been choosing <coughs> candidates correctly for a couple of elections recently. We lost three of them that we're not so right on. Um, I was just wondering what you thought um, like factors were that made that happen. Mm -hmm. I know one of the articles addressed that um, New Hampshire wasn't as diverse as the rest of the country, and do you think that that plays a role in lately, as the country gets more diverse and New Hampshire isn't up to par mm -hmm. with that diversity, do you think that plays a role in the nominees that they choose? I, I, think, I think there is an issue with diversity, but I don't think it is as much ethnic diversity as it is ideological diversity. Um, the New Hampshire Republican electorate is a moderate Republican elector. It's a Northeastern Republican elector, what we used to call Rockefeller Republicans, uh, after Nelson Rockefeller. Um, and for uh, uh, illustrate that um, uh, New Hampshire Republicans, likely New Hampshire Republican primary voters, are more pro-choice on the issue of abortion than the country is as a whole. Uh, they're split on the issue of gay marriage, whereas Republicans other states are strongly opposed to legalizing gay marriage. Uh, we have the second least religious state in the country. So on the Republican side, the New Hampshire electorate is very, very different than the Iowa electorate or the South Carolina electorate or some of the other southern states that are very strong parts of the Republican Party. So a candidate like a Mitt Romney or a Rudy Giuliani or a John McCain or a George H.W. or George W. Bush, because he did not run as a conservative really in 2000. They can win in New Hampshire. They can do well up here. Whereas a staunch conservative candidate, particularly a social conservative candidate, is going to have a much more difficult time winning in New Hampshire. That doesn't mean that a candidate from a party can really buy the, in, get, who, who uh, acquires the institutional support of their party, like a Al Gore in 2000, or a Walter Mondale in 2004, or George W. Bush in 2000, they can get that steamroller together, which means that you can uh, roll over somebody from New Hampshire uh, who wins New Hampshire um, but doesn't have that sort of organizational strength. Um, so I think that diversity is a problem. New Hampshire Democrats tend to be more liberal than Democrats in other parts of the country. They're high income, high education Democrats, more of like a liberal elite Democrat. And that's not the case in states like Iowa or other states where there's a much stronger union 
uh, our blue-collar uh, Democratic uh, uh, base. So there are some differences between the New Hampshire electorates and the electorates in other states, which I think is more important than any sort of, of racial or ethnic differences between them. Well, I've kept you past time. Um, just a reminder, uh, Secretary of State Gardner will be here Thursday. Uh, if you have any questions about the readings from his, uh, from his book, um, please be uh, prepared to ask him. And thank you very much, and thank you folks at home for watching. <laughs>